farming and wool prices were very poor in the, in the leading up to 82 in the 70s. So the economy was struggling uh, and uh, a lot of Falkland Islanders were, were leaving. They couldn't see any future. They could only see the possibility that Argentina would take over. There wasn't a great future for, for young people that were living here. People compared it really to life in the 50s and 60s. There's people concerned about what Argentina would do. People didn't want to become part of Argentina, which all the signals were. Forty-eight hours before the invasion, uh, there was no sleep involved. It was everything was getting prepared. There was people going here, there, and everywhere. We knew there was summer that could be going down, although we didn't know how serious it was going to be. I mean, I remember the, the day before in particular, where there was this strange uh, sense of tension in the air. We knew something was happening, and even as a ten-year-old, I, mean, I had no concept that we were about to be invaded, but. It was tangible in the air that there was something going on. We'd, we'd given as good as we got. I think they started looking at it when the Argentinians brought the uh, 30 mil cannons ashore on the APCs and sent a couple of shells over Gundwa House. That's, I suppose that's the only time I really felt uh, a bit scared, believe it or not. We heard the fighting coming in, we were of course listening to the radio in the same way as everybody else was, sheltering under a sofa and a kitchen table, and it was absolutely terrifying. At that point we had no idea what might happen, um, and it was petrifying. When the Admiral Boost came ashore, one of the first things he said was, get them on the feet, do not make them sort of lie down, uh, because obviously we'd put up a good fight, and uh, he'd uh, respected what we'd done. We went from being this quiet, peaceful, uh, free little country to suddenly having the streets full of, of armed troops speaking a different language, to our freedom being uh, completely curtailed. The Falkland Islands were occupied illegally by Argentina without warning. The onset of the Antarctic winter left little time to prepare the task force. To see the Argentine flags up in the Secretariat their armoured cars coming up the road, all these Argentine soldiers everywhere. You know, it was pretty disconcerting to say the very least, very worried. I thought, well, what's going to happen now? So I went out and stood out in the, in the rough sheep paddock there, and nothing happened, nothing happened. And I saw there were sort of heads bobbing around, the people crawling along on their bellies. And I could see they had guns and bazookas and all sorts of weird things all pointing at me. And then there was a dead gander, a white gander, an upland goose. Um, just beside me. So I bent down and picked him up and waved these white feathers at them and that, that, that seemed to be okay. And so, and then they, they came forward and uh, it was a bit tense, but uh, I think one way and the other we managed to relax them fairly quickly. Well, it was a shattering experience uh, to say the least. But uh, when these officers arrived, Pedrosa and a few others, they said to me, to, we want you to all go to the recreation hall uh, for an important meeting about your safety because the bad British are bombing us. And we were taken, I was taken down in a vehicle to stand at the airport and there was an Argentine Hercules aircraft sitting there with this engine, pro propellers turning. People were going on board and I thought, we're going to be on that, we're going to be taken to Argentina and never seen again. We put on a helicopter taken out to Fox Bay, West Falkland. When we landed there, the Argentine officer met us and said, well, what are you people doing here? He didn't, he had never been told. So he said, right, you don't go outside the, the yard, the garden. Don't you give me any trouble, I won't give you any trouble. And we all had to go make our way to the hall, people from Darwin as well. And it wasn't until 10 o'clock when everybody got into the hall and we realised the book was closed on the meeting because the armed soldiers turned up at the doors, two on each door and one at every window with their FN rifles, so the meeting never did happen. My mum worked on the radio telephone station, um, which kept the link between Stanley and camp. And uh, Invasion Morning, a moment that will stay with me forever, was she, she went down to open up the RT station um, and she couldn't find a, you know, a white flag. For her, she, the best she could find was a, a doll's dress that I had, and she sort of folded it over, walked off up the road, waving this thing in the middle of all these you know, armed troops. And I remember watching her leave, 
being just so frightened that I wouldn't see her again. I actually went and saw my boss and volunteered to, to come on the, on the trip down. Not really at that point understanding what was in front of us, but this was completely different. This was where you was waiting for a soldier to come over the hill and fighting, you know. I mean, so it was a different feeling than anything I'd been through before. And the words that really sobered me up anyway, and many of my shipmates, was some of us will not be going home. Mm. We got sh shot up and um, was under artillery fire for about 45 minutes. My own uh, period in the, the island during the conflict was very short because I was uh, e evacuated, having become a casualty. They could never prepare you for, and that was jets attacking you. You know, that was so, so frightening, it really was. And I found that really, really frightening. And, and I've suffered a little bit throughout life with, with the bombing that day of Ajax Bay. A helicopter came in to, to, to rescue us. And unfortunately, that, that crash landed uh, right in front of us. Bob Iveson was shot down on the 27th of, of May, and he landed close to the house. And he came to my house in Goose Green afterwards, and he said he'd like to pay for the can of baked beans he had uh, whilst the, he was watching the battle for Goose Green. And I said, well, a can of baked beans is probably six and eight pence. I said, I think I owe you still. <laughs> Three bombs were it actually hit Coventry, two of which exploded. I was badly burnt, 27% burns. The fuses hadn't been set quite correctly and some bombs that hadn't been going off because the fuses hadn't gone to impact. Their intelligence officer, who I met in the year 2000 actually, told me face to face that at midnight he reset those fuses because the information he learned from the BBC. And this cross and this ring was, were on me and I still have these today. And that's what I left the ship with. Um, just decided I'd make my way out of that ship. I wanted to see my wife and two boys again. And finally, Tuesday, June the 15th, the capitulation of the Argentine forces. So we were just, literally, we walked up past the monument towards the end of town there, thanking them all as they came in. It was really emotional, really amazing. Um, you know, yeah, yeah, I'd say impossible to describe, but, but an incredible moment for us. And so I said to the commanding officer, there's a helicopter up there. He said, no, 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 there's no, there's no helicopter. I said, there is a helicopter. And he listened, he said, no, 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 they're not allowed to shoot. There's been a ceasefire. I said, no, they haven't. You surrendered. How do you know we surrendered? I said, I heard it on the radio. I knew you had a radio, he said. There was a young lad riding around on a motorbike that he'd managed to <laughs> pull aside. You know, we just spoke to him briefly and he, he was so excited to have his freedom, really. I mean, that, that always strikes me. I don't know how old he was, about 12, I guess, but yeah. And I came back in 2014 and found what I thought was the spot where, the, the, where we had been on that patrol, found all the shell holes. It wasn't until he was walking away that uh, John Jones from Race Point Farm said, what, what is that over there? We took a wander over and it was the, the helicopter blade from the, the helicopter that crash landed in front of us during the rescue. I, I didn't talk about it at all for a long time and some people look on it as a time which was really exciting and everything else and other people were very frightened and such like and we all dealt with it differently and you can't blame anybody for the way they deal with it. We'll never forget the sacrifices that's been made for the Falklands and uh, we'll be grateful forever. I was once at a Sheep Owners Association meeting where the secretary said you can't be grateful forever. I said just Watch this face, watch me, and I will be.
And it was just the sheer mess of Stanley coming back to think that my homeland had been treated in this way. It was just really gut-wrenching. And shell-shocked is not the right word to use, but people were definitely in a state of uh, disquiet, not able to, to cope with the, with the situation, and for, certainly for the first six, nine months. Um, very, very uh, different to, 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 the, to the way we'd known it. I mean, the Falklands changed overnight. I mean, they occupied the islands for 10 weeks. Uh, we thought, well, that's the last we've seen of them, and they've gone and they've taken everything, you know, with them that they wanted to take. And then we discovered they put the mines down. Why did they do that, we said. So we were a bit angry with them as well, I have to say. Uh, it was very sad to find out that many of our most treasured locations, where we would go with our children, all those areas were simply out of bounds. And we, never, we didn't know then, would they ever be cleared, uh, what the plans were, who would clear them. Uh, it, it was so much uncertainty. I grew up with the, the kind of the, the spectre of the conflict hanging over us, um, as, it, as it, I suppose it still does today. You know, with me, it was, when I was growing up, it was right there, right over your shoulder. Like, there's this, you know, you know, there's people around you who have, on reflection, people who have quite bad post-traumatic stress. Um, and you know, there's obvious scars. And there was a rumour at one stage that these mines could, could never be cleared um, and perhaps they might have to move the capital somewhere else. So uh, that, that was a mind-boggling thought. Okay, when you say it's firing now, both together. Firing now! Press now. just absolutely amazing that uh, we can go and tramp about all over the place. You know, some mighty brave chaps. During, during the project, we've, I think we've over a hundred people on the stage and we had, we had seven teams. On, on the day that we actually finished the demining, which was the 14th of uh, October, and uh, as, as the, the, the last bucket came out, a great feeling. It, it, but it was also a sad feeling because a lot of the guys that have been you know, working through all these years uh, uh, weren't, weren't here. So the last time I had been on York Bay was actually with my late father. And so when I walked through that bit, and that was, that was the last image that I actually saw was, you know, you know that was the last time I saw York Bay was my, was my father galloping down there. <laughs> now you made me no. cry. <laughs> I still find it quite, quite emotional to think that, that my son will grow up without that in the back of his mind. Yeah, I'm really hopeful that, that the generation that, that grow up now can really have that, can grow up without that hanging over them. And I think that will, will, a, will help them. I think that will make them feel more free and more, more kind of included um, in the world, generally speaking. The second Shackleton report, um, again, made a, uh, put forward a lot of ideas of how the Falklands economy could be developed and how the community could be strengthened. And key amongst those was the creation of the, the Falklands uh, fisheries zone. So suddenly we were, we were managing our own fisheries, we were selling uh, the fishing licences um, to the companies and so this wealth was coming into the Falklands. And, and really that has allowed us to take the country forward. Um, you know, on every level in those 40 years since. So it was, it was a pivotal moment uh, for the Falklands development. And it is a tight-knit community, but at the same time there's also a big transient community, so you don't get that um, claustrophobic feeling that, you, that some people um, not here might expect that a small community would have, and I really appreciate that. It is, it is a very nice place to live, you know, a very nice place to work, because if you want to work, there's always work for you. If you, you know, want to live here, people are always welcome. The, you know, the, the wildlife is awesome. I was very young when I came here. Um, that was in 2004. I was 24 years old. And yeah, for an adventure, uh, for a life changing. 
We came, came as a family and, and we thought we would do two years, but my wife really enjoyed it. Um, as long as my family was happy, then I'm, I'm happy. No, I had no thought that, that I would still, still be in Falkland 20 years later. And it's, it's a very good opportunity. What, that's what a parent would want to see their you know, kids achieving. Well, at least you can see them and you can encourage them. And that actually keeps you going and makes you make, make, give you that big smile on your face. I decided to, you know what, I can stay another year. And so on. It happened for at least the first seven years. At the moment, I'm not planning to leave. I'm planning, this is home for me. What I've been so impressed with in the Falklands is, is, is how it's developed. You know, from first starting off that plane into 2002, bumping down the MPA road into town, and, and now to see how how Stanley has developed, the whole Falklands have developed over the last coming up for 20 years. It's, it's, it's been impressive. Yeah, it's been impressive for me. The Yes cast was 1,513, which represents 98.8%. And so the referendum, I think, was so important. It actually, it, it properly gathered the, the opinion and the voice of Falkland Islanders once and for all. It's, it's critical to us that we are able to express our own voice and we, we make our own laws, we run our own uh, finances. And so we will always, I think, as Falkland Islanders, fight to be heard and to express our opinion and to make our political choices freely. We're also a, a, a quite an important place for the, for the UK in terms of a jumping off point for science and, and particularly in, in these current times for environmental science, for reaching out into uh, the Southern Ocean and Antarctica to understand, well, to understand our environment and our resources. Um, and I, I, I think, you know, our, our strategic to, importance to the UK should be considered to be quite major. Um, on, on many different levels, uh, but part of it is very much that little bastion of, of uh, democracy and stability in the South Atlantic. It was like, it's really a bit like BC and AD 82. We need to look at it more in the side of commemorating the people who died for our freedom and such like, rather than our experiences and what a hard time I had during the war and that lasted people pinched all my aftershave or something, you know. Talk about the real things, and that's the families of the people who lost, that lost their sons or husbands. But on the other hand too, we must make sure we work and grow the Falklands because of what happened in 82. Veterans from the war and a lot of Falkland Islanders you know, won't be around for the 50th probably. <laughs> and I think it's a good time to capture the experiences that people went through uh, and, uh, and just, just cement those in, in history. And it's important that we, we take stock and remember why we're here and what we're doing to carry the Falklands forward. I think that's, that's critical. I suspect that nowhere else that I know would have made such advances in 40 years as what this place has. Here we are now, a totally different, different place and situation. So I think the exciting thing for me is that we're looking at the future, progressing our kind of society and our economy and everything else, but fundamentally we've really seem to be starting to take a grip on, on protecting that environment. For our, for our generation in the future and for, and for other visitors and things as well. So I think that's, for me at the moment, that's one of the most exciting areas of, of growth and, and change. Um, we're very proud to be a part of the British family and to be a, an overseas territory of, of the UK. The book will never be closed, but we will always move on to another chapter 